Well, good morning. Welcome to Granger Missionary Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, whether you're joining us here in person or online, we're just so gl- happy to have you with us. Uh, and if you, this is your first time here and you're a visitor, we'd love to have you fill out a welcome card, uh, our connection card that should be in the pew in front of you. Uh, or you can find it on our website, grangermc.com, or uh, on our app, uh, you can find a connection card. Um, as we prepare for the beginning of this service, we have a, a short little announcement as a video. Oh, hey. How you doing? Yeah, I was just doing some work on the uh, father-son camp. No, that's, that's coming up September 30th. Yeah, we, we camp out right here at the church. Yeah, it's for dads and sons, or uh, you can adopt a son for the weekend and bring them along, and we just camp out, we, we hang out, we have some activities, we roast some food over the fire, we just have a really good time. You've never been to one? Oh, you got to come out. No, it's right here at the church. We, no, right down, did you know we have some camping spots down there? Here, let me show you. Follow me. didn't even know that we had a cross down here. This will be our main camp area where we have our fire pit and we'll set up some tents around here and we'll eat here, we'll we'll have some fun, have some activities, but we might also camp along the prayer trail. You, You didn't know we had a prayer trail? Let me show you. So this is our prayer trail. We actually have a, a, a prayer walk. You can walk at any time that goes through all these woods and is a great time. You can end at the cross and just spend some time praying to the Lord. But we'll also, that Saturday, we'll camp and we'll have tents all throughout here and have some act. Wondered where that got to. That's, it might be for one of our activities, but we'll have some activities. We'll have some fun for the kids, some glow sticks. It'll be a blast. Matter of fact, this area right here is where we were last year. We had a really awesome time. We, we had all kinds of tents laid out and, and these must have been from last year. Yeah, anyway, come on out. Even if you didn't sign up, September 30th, Father's Sons, we're gonna have an awesome time together and do some really cool activities. See you then. My name is Emily. I am the student ministry director here at Granger MC. And um, Reconnect Sunday was last Sunday, which was uh, really awesome and a time to get to know your family a little bit more. So I would like to introduce you to my family. We actually just did family pictures here last night. So this is a very, very recent family photo. Um, This is most of my family. It's myself, my husband, Josh, in the blue. And then going from left to right in the cute little maroon dress, that's my daughter, Isla. She's nine. Um, My son, Asher, on the right is eight. My daughter, Ellie, in the yellow dress in front is three. And then our youngest, Brooklyn, is one. So that's just a little snapshot of uh, most of my family there. So um, my husband is an awesome ministry support in his home this morning with um, a sick uh, youngest one. So anyway, so we've got like 50% of the kids here today, but the other 50 are at, at home. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Anderson University with a degree in family science and a degree in Christian ministry and um, always dreamed and felt God calling me to a position like this and um, feel really, really blessed to be able to serve around our uh, our youth ministry. So 
a uh, little bit about me. Now, we have lots of announcements because right now we are a church on the move. So I'm going to try and hit everything. Um, guests, if this is your first time here, welcome. We're really glad that you're here today. Um, please take a moment and fill out a connection card there in front of you in the pew. And then also please stop by our um, wood welcome wall um, out in the atrium area after service. We would love to meet you person to person and talk to you a little bit and get to know you um, and give you a little gift that's just a thank you for coming to check us out today. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we, um, we just saw a video about the Father-Son Camp, September 30th through October 1st. Um, you can come around 5 in the evening, and then we're done. Uh, not we. I won't be there. I'm not a father or a son. Um, they will be done around 10 a.m. Uh, the following morning. So bring a tent, bring food to cook over the fire. There'll be some extra food in case you forget. Um, if you could sign up, that would be awesome, just so we kind of have a ballpark idea of how many um, fathers and sons will be attending. That'd be awesome. You can totally scan this QR code up on the screen, or you can sign up in the church app, um, or just let Bethy or Jason know that you're interested in coming. That'd be great. Um, marriage retreat is coming up. Just a small little plug myself, uh, marriage retreat. My husband and I went last year. Um, it was an absolute blessing for us to get away from our, our whole gaggle of children at home and have some time to just connect as husband and wife. A um, couple different highlights. There had been a couple of conversations that I think we just had been kind of avoiding in our marriage. And just getting that time away to have those conversations, you know, just he and I without a mom, dad um, in the background, that was just a real blessing for us. I think also there was a lot of laughter too. We had a lot of fun, um, a lot of jokes and a lot of um, just laughter sharing amongst the couples. And I think another thing that we really enjoyed was just knowing that we weren't alone and having those sometimes messy parts of marriage, right? Like we all have those hard times where we struggle every now and again. And just knowing that like we aren't the only couple that has those types of you know times or periods in life was really reassuring for us. So if you're kind of on the fence about marriage retreat, I highly encourage it. We're like at the end of last marriage retreat, Josh and I are like, yeah, we're going next year. Like that's totally happening. So, um, and I think most of the couples that were there last year uh, felt the same way. So if you are interested, again, we have another QR code up on the screen um, or you can register through the app or again, just talk to one of us staff members and we can help to get you connected and, and signed up for that. Um, it is October 21st through 23rd at Gull Lake Ministries, which is in Hickory Corners, Michigan. Um, the cost is $300 per couple for the whole weekend. Um, that includes everything. Um, we don't want money to be a hindering in you being able to go. So if you and your spouse really want to attend, but the money is... Um, an issue, please let us know. We don't want that to stop you from going. We want to be able to, to feed marriages in this church. Um, on the flip side of that, if you feel called to sponsor um, or to be able to help a couple to go and just bless them financially in that way, would you let one of us staff members know as well? Um, you can also just write a check, drop it in the giving box, and put, you know, marriage retreat sponsor um, on the check memo. That would be great. Um, so yeah, be in prayer about that. If there's a, you know, you would just like to sponsor a couple and bless their marriage. Um, one other thing, um, the youth, we did a small service project Thursday night and we have some goodies. We've been talking about community. We've been talking about what it means to be church, uh, and to be unified. And so we decided we wanted to show a little love to our church this Sunday. So youth, don't forget during the last worship song to meet me out by Bethy's office. And just make sure that as you leave today that you connect with one of our youth. Um, we've just got a little treat for you as you leave today, just a way to, to connect our students to, to the rest of the conver uh, conversation, congregation. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then um, we'll do greeting time right after that. So let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come, God, and just worship you, to be in community with others, God, who are seeking you. 
I pray your blessing over this service. I pray for your spirit, God, to just fall here on our hearts, Lord. I pray for heart change to happen today in all of us, God, that we would walk out of here different than how we came in, Lord. I just pray your blessing over our worship, over the message, over our prayers, and over our time together this morning. Thank you so much for all that you have blessed each one of us with and everything that you've blessed this church with, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Now is your time to rise and shine and greet everyone around you. Say good morning to those around you today. morning church <laughs> who's ready to worship who's ready to worship <sighs> God is good
If his pens are chain the broken or washing filthy feet, here I am, Lord, send me. If it's loving one another, even when we don't agree, here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm poor or if I'm wealthy, I will serve you just the same. Cause here I am, Lord, send me on the mountain or the valley. Oh, I will choose to praise. Here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm known by how I love, let my life reflect how much I love you, I love you. And before you even ask, oh, my answer will be yes, cause I love you, I love you. truth cuts like an arrow, I will say it anyway, cause here I am, Lord, send me, and if it means that they'll reject me, Lord, I'll still obey, cause here I am, Lord, send me, and if I'm
can take it. You can sit down. <laughs> Well, good morning once again to Grange Missionary Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. You know, one of the things that we're passionate about here at Grange Missionary Church is discipleship. I don't know if you knew, but my uh, title before I came uh, to Grange Missionary Church as lead pastor was, uh, well, I, I, I did a short stint working in the, um, in the world workforce, bef- uh, but prior to that, uh, I was in the church for many years as a pastor of discipleship. So discipleship is something that we're passionate about because that's how we grow as believers. It's how we become more like Christ. It's how we go on mission when we sing, send me. It's, it's us moving forward and actually uh, showing and seeing how we can interact and how we can uh, uh, advance the kingdom of God in this world. And uh, one of the things I love about discipleship, and I have a stack of books in my office about discipleship, and the one thing that always bothered me was many of the books that I read would say, well, there's, uh, you start here, you read this many verses, you do this many things, right? You, you say this many prayers, and whiz, bang, boom, out of the, out of the, 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 the machine pops a disciple, and that's not really many of my, that wasn't my journey as a disciple, and I'm sure it probably isn't uh, uh, resonate with many of you in your journey of discipleship. Discipleship is really less about how much you know about Jesus and more about how much you desire to follow him. I mean, let's be honest, right? How many of you have ever done a diet and you're like, man, if I could just know how to do it, I would be able to do it. That's not the problem, is it? The problem is we don't want to do it. And the same is true in our lives, even as, as believers. It's not about what we know, it's about how, how our, what our desires are. And so we have, as believers, we have the, the benefit of the Holy Spirit helping to reshape our desires. See, our desires steer our actions. The real issue is probably not that you need to know more about Jesus to follow him. It's that you need to change your desires to want to follow him more. Uh, James K.A. Smith said this, you can't just think your way into new hungers, He also said, the orientation of the heart happens from the bottom up through the formation of our habits of desire. Learning to love God takes practice. And this is why we do the things we do. This is why we sing the way we sing. This is why we sing what we sing. This is why we, we, we gather around God's word. This is also why at Grange Missionary Church we do Rooted. Now I know some of you think, oh, it's a shameless plug for a program of the church. It's not. Because rooted is not just a teaching, it's an experience. As a pastor of discipleship, I was looking for something like Rooted for quite some time. The the history of Rooted was it began as as a church on the West Coast went over to Africa and began to see how they were forming disciples in the tribal villages so quickly and and, and so uh, without all of the the, the, um, uh, uh, ideas and everything that we have in the Western world, they were able to simply grab people, quickly form them into followers of Christ such that they were able to lead others. And they began to ask, how do you do this? And it was based on this, not just what they know, but reshaping their desires. Rooted is a 10-week interactive experience. You just need to pause or, or, or put this into your life for 10 weeks and, and, and commit to going through this journey together. And you'll begin to see how God will reshape your desires uh, and so I encourage you, if you've never been a part of Rooted Experience, we have one coming up. 
If you're new to the church, if you've been a believer, I was a believer for many, 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 many years. I have done Rooted twice. I will can't wait to do it again. It's just that experience. If you're the slightest bit curious about what it looks like, what it, what it, what it means, how it fits into your schedule, after the, the service at the welcome wall, through these doors and to your left, we'll have somebody standing there. You can thumb through the book. You can see what it's like and see what it means to shape your Christian formation around habits rather than just knowledge. And I encourage you to look into that. All right, that was my shameless plug for a minute. Okay, so we're about to step into our, 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 our back into the series, asking for a friend. Today we're going to answer the question, what about angels? But before we do, let's take a moment and let's just bring our hearts together in prayer. I feel like it's a holy moment today. And I want to ask God to be with us. Lord God, I, I ask for your spirit to attend to us today. Lord, we know that as we will learn about angels, we're not going to pray to an angel. We're going to pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the only mediator between God and man. And we ask that you would send your spirit to attend to our hearts. The the spirit who inspired men to write these words, we ask, will now illuminate them in our hearts. Bring encouragement where encouragement's needed. Bring conviction where conviction's needed. Bring comfort where comfort is needed. And God, may you just open our eyes Not to learn more about angels only, but to learn more about you. And in so doing, we pray that we will worship, not just today, but through this week. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the question I have for you as we begin today is, what comes to your mind when you think of angels? Maybe a baseball team, right? Cherubs with little white wings and and a harp of some sort. Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life, waiting to get that bell ring, right, so he can earn his wings. Your children, maybe then your mind shifts to fallen angels, right? And we talk about demons. What comes to your mind when you think of demons? I hope that's not your children, but whatever it might be, right? We, sometimes that's, that's scary, that's fearful. We're coming into uh, um, October, which will eventually be Halloween season. So there's all of these things. Some of it seems beautiful and wonderful and mysterious and, and, and even kind of weird at times. And, and, and other parts of it might be scary or, or confusing at best. And so what I want to do today is I want to help us clear some of that up in a, in a way, though, that, uh, that I'll, I'll steer us in just a minute, that will help us focus on how we can actually apply what we learn about angels to our daily lives. Because there's a few different ways we could learn about angels. We could learn about angels through popular culture. We might get the picture of, of wings and robes and, and babies sitting on clouds and, or a little guy that sits on your shoulder here and one over on this side that's telling you the opposite. Maybe you, you could learn through personal experience. Maybe you have a story about something that's happened to you that doesn't seem to make sense or have a physical or natural explanation. And maybe that that was comforting to you or maybe that was scary to you, but you know that there's something else that it pertains to, probably to angels or or the spiritual world of some sort. Or or maybe we could learn about angels through Scripture. Now you can know where I'm going to go with this, right? So preacher man, where are we going? We're going to the Bible. So I hope you have your Bibles. Uh, No matter where or how we come to our current understanding of angels, we must always temper it with what Scripture says. So I'm going to point us back for just a moment. Last week was just fantastic, wasn't it? Reconnect Sunday with Pastor Carlos, GMCE. It was just a blast. Uh, Got to speak. We got to have it in two different languages. Again, just a very unique experience that uh, we hold here very dear. And so I thank you for everybody that helped out and was a part of that. It It was just one of the highlights of our years to be able to spend a worship service with GMCE. But the week before that, we were in our series of asking for a friend, and we were talking about how does God... God speak to me. And if you remember, we said God speaks to us through several different ways, but one way we know that is very clear to us is Scripture. It's what's called the perspicuity of Scripture. That's your $10 word for the day. It means that Scripture is clear to us. A child can understand Scripture, and a scholar can't mind the depths of it. It's clear yet full for all of us. And so this is God's revealed word to us. While he may speak to us in other ways, this is what we temper it all by. And so as we come to learn and understand about angels, whether it's popular culture, we look back to the Bible to see if it fits. Whether it's our own experiences, we come to the Bible and ask how does it explain or or contradict or complement those things that we've um, um, gone through with our, our experience. We use scripture. 
And so it's important that we look at the Bible to help us understand it. But I want us to help remember as we go through it, though, that the Bible's not as clear about angels as it is about Jesus. So I hope you get an interest about the spiritual realm and those sorts of things. But I hope more that your hunger is burning for Jesus, who is very clear in Scripture. And so if Scripture is not as clear about one thing as it is another, it probably wants to know us to know about that which it is clear about, which would be Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the Bible, and we need to remember that. But the real question is, why should we even study angels? Why take time on a Sunday morning to even study angels, besides the fact that some of you have asked about them? What does it matter? What difference does a study of angels even make in my life? Well, I hope we'll see that uh, angels are a part of theology. There's actually a, a part of, of theology that deals with the study of angels. It's, it's crazy. It's called angelology. Well, literally, that, that's what it's called. If you look in a systematic theology book, you look up angelology. And if you're looking up for demons, you look up demonology. You can just pretty much put ology after anything you want, and you'll, you'll be totally fine. But angelology is a subset of theology. Well, what is theology? Theology is the study of theos, right? It's the study of God. And so as we study angels, it should lead us towards, or it's a subset of, the study of God. And really, that is what angels are all about. We study angels not to worship angels, not to become fascinated with angels, but because angels exist solely to point people to God. So in our study of angels, for us, the end result should be a greater worship of God. And if it doesn't, then we've failed. So we're going to walk through today, we're going to see some things about angels, and it should point us towards God, and I believe it will. But kind of to ground us or to root us, I want to turn to Psalm 91, and there's many different places. There's no uh, one passage that talks about angels. There's many different passages. You could turn to Hebrews 1 and through Hebrews 2. You could turn to Psalm 91. You could look at all these different areas where angels pop up throughout Scripture. But they're kind of the silent figures throughout most of the Scripture, and that's by design. That's what God intended them for. They're the secret agents of God's kingdom and of God's service. But there are some places where it pops up and we see and we start to get some glimpses of what angels are like. And we're not going to be able to unpack all of it today. But I hope we can scratch the surface such that we get a better understanding. And again, it points us towards God. But Psalm 91 starts out with, in verse 1, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The psalmist here is, is looking to God to take care of him, to shelter him, protect him, oh, and, and watch over him. And if we skip down to verse 11, you see how God, one way that God does that. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now before we think that that means that the angels are going to give us some sort of a wonderfully blessed life, remove the cars out of the parking lot so we can find the perfect parking spot or clear traffic jams for us, we can see at the end of this uh, uh, psalm what the, to what end the angels work for us or excuse me, work for God to us. And it's for uh, uh, deliverance and for salvation. The psalmist says, because he holds me fast to, fast to me in love, I will deliver him. This is God speaking uh, about the psalmist. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What we see in this passage is that God uses angels to that end, to guard, to care, to comfort, and ultimately to point to salvation, which we understand and know is only through Jesus Christ. So right here we begin to get a picture of what angels are all about and what their purpose is. God commands his angels, so they're his angels, and he commands them, but he commands them concerning us. So this has something to do for us today as we explore this passage, to guard us in all our ways so that we might be drawn toward Towards God, cared and protected towards his salvation. Does that make sense? That's where we're going today. So the origin of angels. I want to talk just a minute about where angels came from. Are you ready? Get ready to write this down in your notes. I have no idea. All right? So take a moment, write it down. Pastor Jason is completely clueless. Time to look for a new pastor. We really don't know because scripture doesn't tell us. We have hints and conjectures. There's two primary words throughout scripture that, that point to angels. 
And in both cases, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, while there are many words that refer to angels or, or the spiritual realm, the two primary words in both one in the Old and one in the New both refer to uh, them being messengers. And so we know that based on the name that the primary role of, of what angels are, they're messengers, God's messengers. But they come through in other terms such as Job 1, the sons of Elohim, Psalm 89, holy ones. Daniel 4 refers to the watchers. Psalm 89 talks about the council. And 66, uh, 60 times in Isaiah, we, we hear the, the term the host. The host of heaven. The Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts is his name, right? The Lord of all of the hosts of, of angels. The Bible says little about how angels came to be, but since God is the creator, uh, and as we see in Colossians 1.16, it says that, that for by him, by Christ, by God, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, that's another term for the spiritual realm or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So Jesus had a hand in creating the angels. So we know that they are created beings. We know that they're created, but the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when they were created. So we kind of have to kind of read between the scripture lines, which can be a little bit dangerous. But I think we can generally say that since angels appear very early, early in the scripture, and the creation account in Genesis never mentions them, most scholars believe angels were created, or the Genesis account, excuse me, doesn't mention the creation of them. Most scholars believe that angels were sometime, were created sometime prior to the finish of the earthly creation. We, we, we may just not know that. We, we, we think that also because shortly thereafter, in Genesis 3, we have one of the fallen angels, Satan, speaking to Eve to tempt her and pull her away from God, breaking the relationship there. Genesis 2 says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So that might be a hint that at, by the end of God's physical creation, he had already finished creating all the angels. So we don't know when they were created, but they must have been at some point before the finishing of all of the earthly creation. Uh, being created then before the rest of our physical creation, it would follow that angels are spiritual beings by nature. Although the Bible does talk about times when angels take on human form and other forms as well. Angels seem to be, have been created all at one time, and that's, it's not as though they have families of angels. So that's a little baby angel that you see is not really like because of mommy angel and daddy angel, right? Jesus tells us that, uh, uh, that the angels, are, are ni they ne neither marry nor are they given in marriage. That's, that's something unique to, to this earth is the, the propagation of a species um, based on male and female. And something very unique to us as humans who are created in the image of God to carry on the image of God through the propagation of our human line. But angels don't seem to have that same, that same um, uh, movement. They seem to have been created all at once. We don't know how many angels there are. We do know there's a lot. Deuteronomy talks about the fact that when the, um, from, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us, he shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of holy ones. Psalm 68 says, The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. Now, I'm no mathematician, but that's how I usually add. It was like twice of ten thousands and thousands and ten thousands. Because in, in ancient Hebrew, they, they didn't really take time to count. Well, there was 4,226,923 angels. They just said there's ten thousands and thousands. There's so many of them. Jesus even said in Matthew 26, don't you know that I could in one moment appeal to my father and have more than 12 legions of angels. And a legion in a Roman army could be anywhere up to 6,000 men. Legions and legions of angels. We know by what angels do throughout Scripture that they're intelligent. They can have a lot of power as God grants it to them, but they are not like God who has all power and all knowledge. They are limited as they are uh, creatures. We also know that somewhere between the creation of these angels, whenever that was, and Genesis 3, where we find the fall of man, 
that was instigated or tempted by one of the fallen angels, somewhere in that line that Scripture is silent about, that many angels fell and sinned against God. And so we have then the, the angels of God who do his bidding and the fallen angels, which we refer to as demons, who do the chief of demons, Satan. They do his bidding, which is opposite of the will of God. Second Peter talks about the fact that angels can sin. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, then he talks about casting them into hell and, and committing them to chains. Jude 6 also says it, talks about that. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, God has kept for them judgment. So we have the idea that angels are moral agents. They have the ability to choose right and wrong. And it would seem from Scripture that there was this one time when they chose and some fell from heaven and some have stayed with God. And, and we don't know the exact number between them, but we know that there are these two camps of angels, the chief of which is Satan, who was once an angel himself, and whose name literally means the accuser. His goal is to falsely accuse both God and humans, to falsely accuse uh, God to humans, to us, and falsely accuse humans to each other and to God. His goal is to pull us away from following God, while the hosts of heaven, their goal is to point us towards following God. So that, in a very brief nutshell, is the origin of angels. And I'm sure that probably just stirred a bunch more questions for you in your mind, which I won't be able to answer yet. So I'm sorry about that. If you have any, again, this is another shameless plug. If you have additional questions, I'd be happy. I'd love to meet with you. You can find it on our app or find it on the website. Instead of asking for a friend, it has switched over to asking for myself, and you can ask me some more questions, and I hopefully will have some of those answers or be able to find someone who does, and we'll dig a little deeper. But that's a general idea of the origin of angels. I don't want to spend all the time there because I really want to ask, what does that mean for us? Who cares, Jason? That's a great, neat little story. And, and that's, that's great. We could dig deeper. We could find all the passages. We could go one by one through the passages and see what it teaches us about angels. But we're not here to learn about angels only, are we? We're here to learn about God. And how these, this understanding of this branch of theology points us towards God and then gives us something as we walk out. And the first thing I want us to see and to learn from this study of angels is that the spiritual realm is real. The stories of Scripture show us not only that the spiritual realm is real, but there is in reality very little separation between the two, the physical reality that we experience and the spiritual realm, which we don't always experience physically. There's very little difference between the two. While we may think that there's a far gap or that angels are way up there in the heaven, right? They, they had to fall from heaven or Clarence had to come from the sky because these talking stars on It's a Wonderful Life clearly showed a, a clear picture of theology for us, right? So obviously that's where all of these angels are. When in reality, angels are right around us. There are angels here today. Scripture would, would seem to indicate that there are those right around us. And I know Christine and I could share stories with you of how we've seen the spiritual realm interact with our physical realm in a way that is not, explain, uh, that is not explainable by any ordinary means. Matter of fact, when we tell the story, some people just say, well, uh, yeah, you, you obviously, you're embellishing it or you, you don't remember it correctly, but uh, my wife is readily available to correct me at any time, and we have the same story on that. And we saw how God overcame more than likely, there are many of us in here that could share similar stories or, or stories that are unexplainable by physical means, because that raises with us or gives us the awareness that the spiritual realm is real. Uh, but the problem is many of us walk around our daily lives with that awareness. How many of you came in today and wondered where the angels are? right? Wondered if you were sitting on one or sitting near one or if there, was, if, there was, if there was a heavy presence of God's messengers with us or maybe if one of you is an angel. And some of you are like, I, I know my husband, he ain't no angel, right? My wife, mm-mm. But the scripture teach, it tells us that we might at some point be hosting angels unawares, but this, the reason why we have little awareness for this is because many of us, 
in our reaction to learning about the spiritual realm, however we come about it, through movies, popular culture, through experience, or even through scripture, we tend to react to the spiritual world and see the spiritual realm as either a fable, as a fascination, or a fear. Some of us see the, the, the spiritual realm as a fable. With the advent of the scientific revolution in the 18th century, man began to understand more about the physical world around him. And he began to demystify things that once only were attributed to spiritual beings. Lightning would flash, the gods are mad, right? The rain came down so the gods are happy. We learn later it's about static electricity and clouds and, and the water cycle. And so, yeah, God has nothing to do with that. It's only later that we begin to say, wait a minute, because God created everything, actually God has everything to do with that. But during that time, there there seems to be this, uh, this pervasive move within what many would call the modern movement, which has us demystify and find rational, reasonable, physical explanations for the world around us. And so some of you may be thinking, well, how come we don't see the spiritual realm break in? And I I often have to wonder if it's because Satan says, I don't need it to. If you're happy to think the spiritual realm doesn't exist, Satan's perfectly fine to leave you that way. Matter of fact, uh, as C.S. Lewis wrote in the screw tape letters uh, of one demon, a a fable of of an older demon writing to a younger demon on how to keep Christians from following God, he explains that our goal is to try to distract them, not to think that we're even real. And it has worked for the majority of our world around us when we believe that the supernatural world is nothing but a fable. In the words of the great theologian and and theology book of Horton Hears a Who, uh, you remember that they say if you can't see it, taste it, smell it, or touch it, what? It doesn't exist. And so the idea is that our senses can tell us the only things that are real. But as I said, we can tell stories, we can tell testimonies, We know, because it says in Ecclesiastes that God has created in us and put in the hearts of man the understanding of eternity. We know there's something more. And really, it's not out there, but right around us. This is a dangerous thought, this idea that the spiritual realm is a fable, because this modern revolution, this modern movement was probably the greatest Trojan horse of Satan. He can weasel his way and work his way throughout society and we're never aware of his presence. Case in point, how many of you thought this week about how your physical actions might actually affect the spiritual realities around you? How your sin might be actually pushing away God's presence and what God wants to do in the world and actually inviting the the very actions of what Satan wants to do in this world. Or how you might be able to reach out and by God's nudging through his spirit, work with the angels in comforting or helping somebody when you reach out to them in a moment of desperation or of despair. How often did you think about how you are participating in the spiritual realm? Because we don't have just a benign interaction with the spiritual realm around us. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that it's a war. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, Paul says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's a war. It's a battle. And sometimes we're walking around stepping over dead bodies And moving in between demons as we continue on our daily life, completely oblivious to what's going on. While some people may have a complete uh, um, um, understanding of the physical realm, or a spiritual realm, excuse me, as a fable, some may be drawn more towards it, too much so, that it becomes a fascination. And they'll begin to think about angels a little too much. Or demons begin to limit us in what we do or scare us too much. Matter of fact, I saw a, a, a small cartoon um, teaching children how to pray to the angels. It goes like this. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here. Ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. It's a fascination of the angels, as if the angels can somehow willfully move and change and do things for you apart from what God might do. But we're told in Hebrews that there is one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. We don't need to go to the angels when we have God. 
And they can only do what God tells them to do anyway. They can do nothing apart from the will of God. We have direct access to God. You know what that's like? It's like the prince of a great kingdom asking the butler to provide all of, his, all of the things he needs when your father sits on the throne. Actually, that's not kind of what it's like. That's exactly what it's like. When we look only to this physical realm or we pray to created beings, when the creator is our father and wants to give us all things. Some of us may, though, respond when we understand it's a battle and we see that we understand the world around us. We may respond with a fear. Almost every time a human sees an angel uh, for who they really are outside of human form or, or, or however it might be, the result is fear, and rightfully so. These are beings with great power. Many people result, the result is fear when they see an angel, but and more commonly with demons. And there can be a healthy fear of demons. They are beings of great power, but only as much as it pushes us towards God, the one with all power. It doesn't need to stifle us or stifle us or keep us from moving forward in what God has called us to do because we are in relationship with the one of all power. See, even in the story of Job, Satan himself could do no more than God allowed him to do. The spiritual realm is not a fable. It doesn't warrant undue fascination, and we don't need to have fear of it. Christ has overcome all all of the cosmic powers. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God and is ruler over all. Second thing I want us to see is I want us to see that you are cooler than the angels, but Christ is greater than all. I, I tried to find like, like a more churchy way to put it, but I really just couldn't. You're just cooler than the angels. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I could see an angel, that'd be pretty cool. Right? If I could like, you remember the story uh, of Elijah's servant when, when, when they were, the battle was all around and, and, and he couldn't see the spiritual reality that was around, but, but Elijah could and he said, would you open my servant's eyes to see that though the battle looks strong in front of us, the hosts of the armies of God are all around and he did and he could see all the angels around. I wonder what would happen, how cool would it be if God would open our spiritual eyes and we see how full this room is with the, with the spiritual realities that are all around you. That would be very very cool. I mean, look at the image of, of the angels in front of us. But what's even cooler is that God made us in the image of God. Because if I said, how amazing is that? Look at that being. Look at the image they create. I could be quoting a human to an angel. I really could be quoting an angel about a human. When they see you, they see the image of their creator. They don't see as we see. Now, we, may, we envision an angel. We envision a human body. We envision something that looks like us. We don't see the spiritual realm as, as God can see us. Only when he allows us to see can we see something like that. But when we, when we understand that angels see us and they see the image of our creator and they are astounded, that makes you cooler than the angels. Angels have free will. Angels will experience judgment one day for the choices that they make. You will experience either judgment or reward based on the choice that you make to follow Christ or not. But here's the difference. It makes you much cooler. Only you can experience redemption. The angels, when they make their choice, that's the choice. They will either experience eternity worshiping God or judgment in hell. There is no redemption for the angels God only sent his son. Though we were in rebellion like the fallen angels are in rebellion to God, God saw fit, God saw just, God saw loving to send his only son to become a human. Not to become an angel, but to become a human so that we might have the opportunity to be redeemed back in relationship. The angels, it says, as they see this plan of God's redemption, they look from heaven and are astounded. They long to see, as it says, what God is doing in, on earth. Angels will experience judgment just like we may if we don't know Christ, but we have the opportunity to experience redemption. That makes you cooler. 
Angels may be more sophisticated than you, but you will one day judge them. It says in Psalm 8 that, that we are made a little lower than the angels, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that we, are, we, we should be careful and we should have wisdom to be able to judge our own issues as believers because one day we will even judge the angels. But even in all of that, no matter how cool you think you are and how cool you are, according to the angels, no being is greater than our creator. Though Satan may be great, He's not the creator. See, Satan and God, this isn't a yin and a yang. This isn't a good force versus bad force. This isn't a Darth Vader versus Luke Skywalker. I mean, the closest analogy I can really come up with with Satan and and God would be that it would be like an angry ant trying to stop a running elephant. And even that pales in comparison because they're both created beings. We're talking about one that is the creator versus one that is created. There is no comparison. God is the only one that can say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Mom's like, dang, I've been using that every day. Thought I could use that still. No, only God can use that. Good news is, though, is the creator loves you. No being can do anything to you apart from his loving permission. And I know at times it doesn't always seem loving, but hear me. All of Scripture, the story of Scripture, the very fact that he has sent redemption for you shows the fact that whatever God allows any angel to do, it is out of love, though it may not feel like it in this moment. Remember, you don't even see the spiritual realm. You don't know what's really happening. Paul says in Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? A little bit later in the chapter, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, there is no created thing that can wrench you out of the hand of your creator. There's no need to fear the spiritual realm when God's in control. This is why God's word is so important in our lives. It speaks the truth to us and helps us in that spiritual warfare. When you read the Bible, you are engaged in spiritual warfare. The lies that culture and Satan through culture and Satan speaks to you in trying to have you wander away from God and walk away from God is the the, the very thing that, that Scripture speaks against. And Scripture directly confronts that and reminds you that you cannot be taken out of the hand of God by any of the lies of Satan as long as you hold to the truth. When you pray according to God's word, you are in a spiritual battle. When you memorize scripture, quote it back to yourself or to somebody else who is listening to a lie of Satan, you are fighting with spiritual power. You are affecting the spiritual realms. I love my Old Testament professor uh, had many of these experiences that were unexplainable in the natural world. And we were fascinated by them as, as, uh, as seminary students because he didn't talk about it much. It wasn't a big point of what he talked about, but every now and then it would leak through in a lesson. So we would pin him down and say, hey, how did you deal with that? When you were called into that house that you knew was haunted or, or of some sort, there were spiritual things happening that were obviously uh, the spiritual realm breaking through and you can kind of see what's going on and that would freak me out and and scare everybody. How did you deal with that? What kind of sensor did you use? What kind of smoke filled the house? Did you you go in every room and yell at every demon in every room? We're like, what did you do? And he said, well, I walked into the room, found their couch, sat down, and I prayed. I said, well, what did you pray? And he said, Jesus, you know I can't do anything about this, but you can, so take care of it. And I got up and I walked out. And I said, that's it? And he said, that's it? And I said, what happened? He said, well, they're gone. I was so dumbfounded by that, thinking there needed to be some sort of cosmic battle of screaming and yelling, of verse throwing and Bible ripping that needed to happen in order for these demons to leave. And he reminded me in that quiet moment that we are all just created beings. He's only going to appeal to the creator. It's the creator that does it. I want us to see too that angels minister to you, but they serve God. 
How do angels minister to you? Well, Acts 5 says that they bring deliverance. Uh, they brought, the, the, they brought uh, Peter out of the prison, uh, uh, out of the prison doors. Uh, they guard you. Psalm 91, we read that he, guard, that he commands his angels to guard you. Uh, they serve toward salvation. Hebrews 1.14, now, are not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Uh, we have hints that perhaps even angels escort those uh, who have died in Christ into his presence. Luke 16, Jesus tells this uh, interesting parable, which seems to be uh, Jesus is speaking about something that seems to be more than a parable. So some scholars believe that Jesus in Luke 16, about the, the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, may be more than a parable. Maybe Jesus speaking about spiritual realities that he knows, that, that he, and he gives us a story. And when he talks about this poor man who trusted in God, and when he died, it says that this poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. Now, for whatever, if this was a one-time instance, we don't know, but we do know that, they, that the angels do God's bidding to care and comfort and guard his, his uh, children. So how do they serve God? Well, they serve God by, by worship. Psalm 148, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts. Revelation 5, there's myriads of thousands of angels worshiping God. They deliver messages. Uh, we have Gabriel appeared to Zechariah in Luke 1. Uh, the Gabriel appeared to Mary in, in, in Luke chapter 1. Uh, angels appeared to Philip, Cornelius, Peter, Paul. We know that angels carry out God's messages. They also carry out God's judgment. Second Kings, I love it. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. Like, they woke up the next morning and everybody's dead. Because the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord wiped them out. So we need to remember that while angels minister to us, they don't do our bidding, they do God's bidding. We can't command angels or demons to that effect to do anything. Only by the authority that God would give us or, give or allow for us may we speak with any authority to anything in the spiritual realm. And so we need to be careful that, that, we, don't ever, that we don't use the demon's tool of pride against that very thing that is the demon's. You know, uh, one of my friends in seminary who lived next door, Jibala Fayashile, was a Nigerian brother who uh, ministered as an Anglican priest in, in, in uh, Nigeria. And when he was studying in the United States, we, we would often hear from him, and he, he spoke to our class on spiritual warfare. And so we were interested in what he had to say because we knew he had direct interactions with the local shaman and had some incredible stories that he always uh, caveated with, I know I sound crazy. I wish I had a camera so I could prove it to you. Well, Ajibala began to speak about the things and the realities that would happen, whether it, be, whether it was the woman who had been pregnant for many, many years. Yeah, think about that. He said, I thought this child should have teeth by now, right? It's about the, 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 the chainsaw that when cut the tree would actually cause another person to bleed. It was about the, the snake that was sent into his, into, his, um, into, his, into his house and died at his feet instead of biting him. It was about the man with poison in his hand and his finger uh, on his ring that didn't injure Ajibala because he was the man of God. All of these stories just sound phenomenal and mind-blowing. And so we began to ask him, how do they deal with demons? And he said, well, basically the shaman would call on one demon who's stronger to take out the other demon who's weaker. And when that would be a problem, they'd call on a stronger demon to take out this demon. And when we begin to, uh, to assert our pride and authority over the spiritual realm, we do the very same thing by using the tools of Satan to cast away and move away Satan. So we asked Ajibala, how did you get rid of them? Guess what he told us? He prayed. He said, Ajibla, like, you didn't like have it out with the shaman? He said, I had no idea what to do. He said, so every day I went into the chapel and I knelt down at the, at, the, at the altar and I just prayed, God, would you do something? And every day I'd pray. And he said, for months and months and months he prayed. And then he began to tell the stories of how he, he, they gained deliverance because of the prayers of God's people and how it protected him and protected others and how the local shaman would rage with anger saying, I know the Lord is with you. Why? Because he quoted scripture? Because he shouted at him? No, because he prayed and called on the creator to do what he was unable to do. This leads us to the final thing I want us to see which is that a clear view of angels will always point us towards God. The chief purpose of angels is to point people to God and to worship God. 
The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So a study of the clear view of the angels should result in greater worship of God as they point us towards him. Does that make sense? So this whole understanding of angels should point us towards God. And so if, as you walk through your life and as you watch the movies and as you go through these things and you see these concepts of angels, and if they don't line up with what Scripture says, it's wrong. If a study of angels causes you to think or worship, in a sense, angels more than God, it's wrong. If a study of angels and how to interact with the spiritual world raises pride in your own life, it's wrong. The study of angels should do what the, the purpose of angels is, and point us to God and cause us to worship him. In all that angels do, they point to God's glory. They carry out God's mission on earth. They lead people to worship God as they worship God's, the, God themselves. Everything they do points back to God. In this one sense, we are very similar to the angels. That's our goal. That's our goal job here on earth. That's why you're still here after you accept Christ. It's so that you can glorify God through living your life and point other people to living uh, for God. The real question is, are we doing this? Or are we leaving this whole role? Even though you're much cooler than the angels, even though you display the image of God in a way that angels can never do, you have more tools to point people towards God than angels do. The real question is, are we doing the majority of the work or are angels? Because angels are, exist solely to point people to God. Do you? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we do not need to pray to an angel, or to pray to any other created being to mediate between us. We don't go through a priest. We don't go through uh, uh, apostles. We don't go through angels because we come to Christ. Jesus, you opened the path through your blood, and our faith in what you've done for us on the cross opens the way that we might come directly to the throne of God. That we might come boldly, humbly to the throne of God and ask you to deal with all that we see and all that we do. Lord, we thank you that you take care of us. That you have created beings specifically to move this planet. Lord, how privileged are we? Talk about privilege. You have created beings simply to minister and guard and guide us so that we might worship you. Lord, what are we doing with that? Lord, forgive us if we just don't even think about the fact that, that the spiritual world exists. Lord, would you open our eyes like Elijah's servants? Not so that we might have an unhealthy fascination, not that we might have an unhealthy fear, but that we might be aware of how we affect the spiritual realm. Or maybe how little we are actually pointing people towards God. How little our existence is moving people towards worship. And God, may you wrench our hearts until everything that we do becomes Jesus first in our lives. So that you become most glorious in our lives. That the angels will look down in amazement to watch how we are carrying out the, 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 the story of redemption. As we image God in our families as we image God in the way that we work, as we image God in the way that we play and the things that we do when we're not at work, God, would you motivate our hearts to point people towards you, to worship you and to glorify you. And in so doing, may we join the hosts of heavenly armies in saying, praise him, all you hosts. For the goodness of God is upon us, and the world has seen his glory. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moments that I wake Until in my head I will sing Of the goodness of God Oh my Yeah. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, be majesty, be dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. May you go knowing that the spiritual realm is real and God is king still. If you're new, we'd love to meet you at the welcome wall. There's information for you if you want to find out about Rooted by the Welcome Wall. If you're interested in joining a connections team where you get to greet people, we'll be meeting in the room right over here. Whatever God has for you this week to impact his kingdom, may you be blessed as you go. We'll see you.